hope everybody's doing good uh realized i need to do a video here and i said you know what it's been a minute to uh we haven't done any practical chicken math i know i did one a while back uh quite a while ago i figured you know what let's go ahead and do another one so what we're going to work on today we're going to figure out a couple of different things we're going to start off with how big of an incubator do you need okay now for this example i'm going to say you have five hens okay five hens now you always want to be figuring on your maximum okay there we go now it'll focus so we got five hens and a hen will lay one egg per day so that's seven days in a week okay that's 35 right if i'm wrong it's because i suck at math so let me double check with the calculator here yep says it's 35 all right now you're going okay well the incubator at tractor supply can hold 48 eggs i'm good well, you are good if you're only going to do one week's worth of eggs. Because, you got to remember, the chicken eggs take three weeks to hatch. So then we're going to take that number, we're going to take it times three. Okay. That's 105 eggs. Okay. Now, you also remember that you're going to want a tray for hatching and that's going to take one week's worth of eggs so for five hens you need to be able to handle 140 eggs at a time okay now this brings me to my next point You'll hear, especially the game chicken guys, talk about how you're not going to get anywhere in your breeding program if you hatch 7 or 10 chicks every year. You need to hatch 100 out of one brood pet. Well, 100's kind of an arbitrary number, to be honest. But the idea that the more you have out of a single pair makes sense. So... Just going by this logic, if you're breeding one pair and you want 100 chicks out of that pair, it's going to take you 100 days. Now, you have to remember that it's going to be an additional 21 days. So you've got 100 days equals 100 eggs okay but it's going to be an additional 21 days from the time you put the last eggs in the incubator till you get your last chicks out okay so that incubator would have to run for 121 days now if the average month is 30 days and that means that you would be breeding continuously from that pair for four months straight. Now, I've done it. I mean, I've hatched from February till August before. You don't want that headache. Here's why. Chances are... You're not going to want to be breeding just one pair, okay? If you're a serious breeder, you're going to have multiple matings. So, before you know it, you're going to have three, four hundred chicks running around. I tend to have that many average every year. But I'm breeding a lot more brood pens. Now, 
let's say you've got three brood pens and you're doing this, right? So you're going to have all these little tiny groups of chicks that are a week apart in age. And once they get to be a certain age, you can start grouping them together. But that's, you know, four months times four weeks. You've got to be able to house... See, I told you I suck at math. Sixteen groups of chicks. Okay, and that's not even separating them by breed or bloodline or whatever. You've just got to have the facilities to keep 16 different age groups on their own. You could probably get by with 12, because like I said, once they start hitting a certain age, you can start squeezing them together, you know. Week one and week two can go together. Three and four can go together. That kind of thing. All right. Now, why is it such a big deal to hatch more than 10 chicks? This is where knowledge of Punnett squares and genetics really drives the point home. Okay. Uh, years ago, I used to uh, be really, really good at genetics and Punnett squares. I've gotten rusty over the years. It's hard to believe as that may be for some people but years and years ago um i wanted to make this cross and i ran the punnett square before i made it and it was a multi-gene cross that was very very picky or very very tricky i should say to get what i wanted out of that cross and i think i was working with like 16 different genes to try to line it up to get the bird I needed. Well, to get the bird I needed, I calculated that I was going to have to hatch out several hundred just to produce one. And as because of that, I never made that cross. But the point is, the thing that these guys keep talking about, you've got to hatch hundreds and hundreds to get the perfect one. If you're looking for a very extremely particular group of genes to line up just like planets, yeah, you're going to have to do that. And then the problem comes with the idea of you're not probably going to be able to identify that chick from the moment it's born. So you got to keep every single one of those things alive and then start test mating things to try to get to where you figure out which one is the bird you were after. And that's where they start talking about things like hitting a nick and, you know, having a pair that just really produces extremely phenomenally well. That's when you get the bird that had all the genes lined up. Now, for most of us, we're working on a handful of traits at a time. A lot of those traits require multiple genes to all work together. It's not just like flipping on a light switch. It's like flipping on all the light switches in a uh, warehouse. You know, you can get most of the way there, even if they're not all there. You know, if they're not all turned on, but you can get most of the way there. So, the truth is, even though we're only working on a small handful of genes, the, uh, reality is there's all these other genes that are in play that we're just not taking into consideration because they're not affecting our end goal okay um i can be really focused on leg color for example but the fact of the matter is the genes for eye color leg length uh earlobe color those are all still up in the air too whenever you put together a mating it's just that you're not focused on that and if you have certain traits that are set in your family to where you're not getting variations such as you have a family of birds that are 100 percent yellow legged and have been for years then you kind of don't need to fit figure that gene into the equation it's just a given that it's there now here's the thing with that though and this is where, you know, breeding throws you curveballs. You can be so focused on those legs that by the time you get your legs set, come to find out your eye color 
wasn't as set in your bloodline as you thought it was, and now you have to fix that. You know, that's just the struggle. So the more birds you can breed out, the better of a chance you'll have of selecting the right bird. This kind of plays in with your blues, for example. On paper, if you breed a blue to a blue, you're supposed to get a set percentage that's blue, a set percentage that's splash, and a set percentage that's black. Here's the thing, though. First three weeks, you might get all blues and splashes, not a single black. And then the last week of the season, all the chicks might come black. I know that sounds crazy, but I've seen things like that happen. Uh, on my white hackles, for example, you're supposed to average 50-50 on chicks, right? Well, how, what if I told you I've had it happen where in the same season, I've had one hen come off a nest, she had six or seven stags and one pullet. But then the next hen that hatched off from a different mating, she was complete opposite. So when you averaged them together, it was 50-50, but when you looked at the individual hens, it was completely out of whack. And the other thing, I guess, that makes it challenging as a breeder is the fact that a lot of these genes we can't see. Okay, so we don't know they're there until we test meet. So you hatch out 10, 15 chicks out of a mating and call it good. There might be a gene hiding in there that you don't know about. And if you would have bred 20, you might have had one popped out that showed the gene and then you would have known it was there, but you stopped short. And I know it's, uh, it's a plague of show people all over. They're always like, you know, the one egg that I didn't hatch, that's the one that would have been the show champion. I just know it. Well, you can't hatch them all. And if you try hatching them all, you're not going to be able to care for them all. And you're going to end up losing a portion of them anyway. That's just the reality of it. I mean, I lose birds myself. You know, everybody loses birds. And you're... I guess the one thing that will frustrate you more than anything is when you have a bird that you've put up on a pedestal in your mind and you've set up all this breeding plans around it and then it dies. So what do you do then? You know, um, I lost a bearded buff lace hen this winter and my plan was to back breed to her until she was infertile. Um, she's gone now. I've got some daughters of hers and some sons of hers, but they're not 100% her bloodline. But the reality is, as much as I'm going to miss some of the traits that she had, losing her actually, as harsh as it sounds, did my breeding program a favor because she did have some flaws that I probably would have locked into my flock by breeding back to her so many times. So at least by breeding her partially related offspring, I have a chance to weed those genes out and not let them take root in my breeding program. Okay, now let's do one more thing here with the math real quick. Now I'm gonna go in because once the sun goes down this time of day, or this time of year it starts getting chilly uh, they're talking rain tomorrow and we've still got a couple chances of snow in the forecast it was 71 degrees here today if you can believe that but I had a gal uh, talk to me about her breeding pens and she was trying to figure out how many birds she could fit in it well she said the pen's 16 foot long so we figured two foot per bird so we got eight birds in there that's not how that works. Um, there are different standards for different types of birds. Your production egg birds, it's like, I don't know, two or five square feet per bird. Your hatchery birds. And then you generally have uh, larger space requirements for bigger breeds and exhibition lines and things like that. My standard has always been seven and a half feet square per medium breed such as a game chicken or a leg, uh, leghorn or a polish the game chickens i obviously give a lot more space because of how they are but i said to her i said okay 
you've got a 16 foot uh, coop. Okay, what's the what's the other dimension? She goes 10 foot. Okay, so you got 160 square foot. Now, how much space do you have for the coop? You know, the the shed part of it. And she said, well, that's five by 10. I said, okay, that's another hundred or that's another 50 square foot. So you've got 160 plus 50. So you've got 210 square feet. Now, if you divide that by seven and a half, you could put 28 birds in there, not eight. Obviously, I'm not saying she needs a breeding program that has 28 birds in one giant flock. Uh, what I actually advised her to do was to use that pen as a hen-only pen during the off-season, keep her hens away from the males, let them relax a little, and instead build pens that are suited towards um, breeding pairs, trios, or quads, whichever direction she wishes to go. And the nice thing about that is if you breed pens that are or if you build pens that are only a certain size, you're not going to be tempted to overcrowd them because obviously, you know, you could put three birds in a pen meant for two, kind of be okay, be a little cramped. You put four in there, you're just asking for trouble. So that tries to force you to really think about your breeding program, okay? And the other thing about that is, you know, come the off season, if you want to keep your bird, your roosters in show condition, well, just leave them in the brood pens. Or, you know, with game chickens, if you've got game hens that you can't pair up, you know, they just don't get along in the group, well, just leave the hens in those specific brood pens and pull the cocks out and give them their break, you know. Um, you're not taking up a huge amount of space, you're making use of the pens. If your pens are stationary though, uh, I always liked to give the pens themselves a rest. And what that does is, you know, it gives you time to uh, work the soil. All my pens back home were dirt. You know, you can work the soil, let the uh, microorganisms break down the manure and that kind of thing. You can get some, uh, some of the spent grains and stuff that were in the feed, they'll sprout and help with that. Uh, it also gives a chance to hopefully break the cycle on your external parasites that might be living in there because no matter how much you paint and spray and dust and wash, you're never going to get every nook and cranny. So I always liked leaving my brood pens empty over the winter. And if it was possible, um, without it blowing full of snow, I would actually leave the doors open because that cold air in there I always felt was good for it. Not to mention the fact that uh, it'll let your cats and stuff get in there and hunt down vermin over the winter. So those are just some random things to keep in mind, I guess, relating to chickens and math. Uh, I know chicken math is kind of a ha-ha thing on the internet, but responsible breeding and maintenance of birds does require a little bit of pencil and paperwork, or in my case, a phone calculator. So, anyhow, that's about all I know, and uh, thank you all for watching. Hope you have a good one.